Did Spider-Man make an unapproved cameo in the X-Men animated series? Ever wonder how popular the show was when it first premiered? This is the untold truth of X-Men the Animated Series. In the 1980s, Margaret Lesh was working as a producer in TV animation, helping to get shows like G.I. Joe and Muppet Babies on the air. But she still couldn't get her passion project off the ground, a cartoon adaptation of Marvel's X-Men comics. While working at Hanna-Barbera, Lesh met Stan Lee, Marvel's prolific creator and company face, and pitched him on an X-Men show. She recalled telling Lee in the book previously on X-Men, it's really about a group of disenfranchised teenagers, and a lot of teenagers feel that way. So why wouldn't this be a hit with the kids? Lee was convinced, and the two then set out to pitch the X-Men show. Alas, ABC, NBC, and CBS all passed. Lesh had all but given up until a fourth broadcast network emerged. She eventually became head of Fox Kids, the division of the Fox network responsible for its Saturday morning lineup. So in her new position, she commissioned an X-Men series in 1992. The creative staff for X-Men the Animated Series came together in early 1992, with Fox looking to premiere the series in the fall of that year. Considering the long production lead times required for animation, showrunner Eric Leewald's team had mere weeks to come up with a series bible, which is a 20 to 100 page document outlining the show's world, characters, and aims. Leewald basically had to figure out the entire series in that short period, and it didn't help that he wasn't intimately familiar with the X-Men comic books. A first step toward acquainting himself and his team with the mutant superheroes would be to acquire as many X-Men back issues as possible, but that proved difficult. The title was relatively obscure, and Leewald had to make do with whatever source material he could find. He procured it all in a haphazard way, buying up old anthologies, borrowing issues from friends, and getting Marvel Comics to black and white photocopy old issues and mail them. Most of the show Bible was even heavily influenced by the X-Men board game, the Uncanny X-Men Special Campaign set, which included character descriptions, a map of the X-Mansion, and the official handbook of the Marvel Universe. While the look and feel of X-Men the Animated Series comes from the post-1975 reboot of the comic series, Eric Leewald didn't directly adapt old issues. That's in part because a comic book's method of storytelling is significantly different from that of a TV show. As Leewald explained to Blast from the Past in 2007, time the actual action in a book and you get about three minutes. Longer arcs from the comics were a better fit for adaptation, but as Leewald noted, there we had to deal with the various secondary plots that weave in and out of the main story. Some of those plots worked for a children's cartoon, while others didn't. As Leewald put it, if you were to compare the actual Dark Phoenix books to the animation story, I'd wager that about 50% of the original was trimmed away. Furthermore, Leewald's team couldn't just take old material and animate it, because the public at large wasn't terribly familiar with the vagaries of the franchise. As Seewald told Comics Beat in 2017, when we started, we were telling stories primarily for people unfamiliar with the X-Men world. No one knows who will be a mutant at birth. We discover our extraordinary powers at about your age. X-Men the Animated Series features a massive cast of characters. In addition to those who enjoyed regular appearances, many more mutants arrived for cameos, one-offs, or to populate finite story arcs and then disappear thereafter. Deciding what mutants from the comics to use as the main characters was especially challenging for the cartoon's developers. Marvel helped the show's writers determine which of them were must-haves, such as Professor X, Cyclops, Wolverine, and Jean Grey. But as Eric Leewald told Blast from the past, Beyond that, any out of a couple dozen major mutants could have filled out the rest of the core. Lee Wald and his team decided on Storm because her ability to control the weather would translate well in a visual medium like TV. Rogue was picked because her inability to be touched offered an emotionally compelling characteristic, plus her strength and flight would work well in fight sequences. Additionally, Lee Wald knew that the show needed a juvenile character, and Marvel reps liked Jubilee more than other young mutants. And then Morph, based on a relatively obscure comic character named Changeling, was added for the specific purpose of having a sympathetic friend of Wolverine who would be killed early on. This one's for you, Morph! Fox ordered X-Men in February of 1992 and wanted to debut it that fall, a rather daunting prospect. But somehow Eric Leewald and company were ready for their premiere date, and X-Men the Animated Series debuted on Fox on October 31st, 1992 with the episode Night of the Sentinels Part 1. Fox was so confident in the series and wanted to give it as big of a launch as possible that it aired the initial episode at 7 o'clock p.m. The series then moved to its regular Saturday morning time slot, albeit sporadically. 
Night of the Sentinels Part 2 aired on November 7th, but then the quickly building audience was left without a new episode for three weeks. And then the next new installments didn't air until late January. According to Leewald, the gap was because of animation problems, which took months to fix. This led to major production delays. But once the show got going with regular airings, ratings soared and X-Men became one of the biggest hits in Saturday morning history. As many as 8 million homes tuned in, and some weeks it would attract more viewers than the competition on ABC, CBS, and NBC combined. X-Men the Animated Series marks a watershed moment in both comic adaptations and Saturday morning cartoons. It was one of the first shows to present Marvel Comics characters and stories in a serious and dramatic way, and it was also one of the few kids' cartoons that was serialized. Making such an ambitious series would require a very special cast of voice actors, and X-Men producers found them, though not right away. The casting and voice directors who were used to wacky Saturday morning cartoons didn't understand the show's vibe, so they hired actors who did a lot of silly, broad voices. As Eric Leewald told The Hollywood Reporter in 2017, we tried to convey to them what was different about X-Men, and they didn't hear it. They thought they want to do something goofy and childish. The initial recordings were so bad that the crew had to throw everything out and start over. The voice team worked out of Canada and recruited veterans of the Toronto entertainment world, including Alison Court as Jubilee and Cal Dodd as Wolverine. Interestingly enough, those two already knew each other. Is the child all right? Not for long. They were fighting, and I wanted to help him, and boom! For many Marvel fans, Cal Dodd's portrayal of Wolverine on X-Men the Animated Series is the definitive take on the clawed and conflicted Canadian mutant. Dodd pulled from a number of disparate sources to get the voice just right. During an audition, a casting director told him to emulate tough guy actor Steve McQueen because Wolverine is similarly introspective and quiet. As Dodd recalled to The Hollywood Reporter, he also threw Clint Eastwood and Western star Ward Bond into the mix. Meanwhile, Wolverine's scrappiness came straight from Dodd, who is a Canadian as well. As he revealed to The Hollywood Reporter, I had grown up in a small town with many fights. I had seen these kinds of guys, so I threw in a bit of raspy-voiced DJ Wolfman Jack. Dodd is proud of his work and how it affected the viewers, including one in particular. An overweight, bullied, and depressed fan sent a letter in which he revealed that he had considered suicide. But as Dodd recalled, he was so in love with the X-Men Saturday morning cartoon and Wolverine. He was about to jump off his roof, but then he said, I can't do this. I'm going to miss the Saturday morning X-Men episode. That's the kind of impact it had on kids. You called me friend. One of the most memorable elements of X-Men the Animated Series is its opening sequence. While character identifying clips and scenes of mutant battles fly by at frenetic pace, the soundtrack offers a suitably high-energy theme song built around a speedy, ominous, and totally catchy hard rock guitar riff. And let's not forget those attention-grabbing keyboard stabs. The theme song has brought a lot of joy to a lot of people, even independently of the series, as amateur cover versions are all over YouTube. But it wasn't such a lovely experience actually making the song, according to composer Ron Wasserman. He wrote several songs for X-Men producer Saban Entertainment in the 90s, including the theme for Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Wasserman claims that the company cut him off from talking to anyone at Marvel or Fox about how the song should sound, fearing that they'd poach him for higher-profile composing work. Nevertheless, representatives of Saban were very hands-on and critical. As Wasserman told Inverse in 2016, X-Men was just a boatload of work because there was a lot of involvement. A lot of let's tweak this, make this bigger, redo this. We ended up with 80 or 90 tracks for that thing. They just kept trying to get more and more energy out of it. Superheroes popping up in movies and TV shows about other characters is an almost mundane phenomena in the 21st century. For example, Thor Ragnarok heavily involved the Hulk. Spider-Man was a major part of Captain America Civil War, and dozens of comic book legends all converged together in Avengers Endgame. But back in the early 90s, shared movie and or TV universes weren't a matter of course, especially since the rights to different characters created by the same publishing entity had been sold to several different studios and production companies. Nevertheless, X-Men the Animated Series dabbled in crossovers and universe sharing, even though doing so could violate copyrights and contracts. As a show artist and self-proclaimed treasure hider, Larry Houston revealed to The Hollywood Reporter in 2017, some of my favorite Easter eggs were the unexpected ones that I added for the fans, like Doctor Strange, Deadpool, The Black Panther, all of whom are now superstars in their own feature films. I never added cameos if it distracted from the main story. Higher-ups heard that Houston had added Spider-Man to a scene and ordered it deleted. So as he recalled, I had to sneak him into another episode, but it was just an arm shooting webbing to save someone off-camera from falling debris. 
Obviously, X-Men the Animated Series is based on Marvel's various and long-running X-Men comic book series, but the show proved so popular that it ended up also being influential in the development of the franchise in the other direction. Over time, things introduced by the show's writers were integrated into the comics, making them canonical to the X-Men universe. The 1995-1996 X-Men Comics crossover event Age of Apocalypse was directly inspired by the X-Men the Animated Series two-part episode One Man's Worth. The premise focused on a time-hopping, alternate history adventure in which characters go back in time to kill Professor X, thereby altering the present and sending several X-Men into the future. Eric Seewald conceived the idea, but it came to him from media outside the X-Men universe. As he told Comics Beat in 2017, Most good stories have been told many times in many different forms. I borrowed from It's a Wonderful Life and the Star Trek episode City on the Edge of Forever for the central idea. What would the world have been like without this one crucial man? It's incredible how one kid could mean so much to so many people. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite TV shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.